Come on, can we put our hands together one time? Oh, you can do better than that. Come on, can we just lift it up for the name of Jesus one time? I know that you're probably pretty tired and worn out, and you feel a little bit like these balloons that are just deflating right here in front of me. But I want you to wake up for a second, so jump to your feet really quickly. Come on, get up on your feet. I want to give you 30 seconds to do whatever you got to do to wake yourself up. Get the shakes going. Come on, just wiggle a minute. Just get it going. Wake it up. Wake it up. Maybe you're, there you go, there you go. Maybe your arms were asleep or your foot was asleep. Wiggle it. There you go. All right, y'all can be seated. Y'all can be seated. You feel better about that? That ought to help just a little bit. Are y'all having a good time so far? I feel like it's been a really good time. I want to dive right into tonight's message because I think we have a really incredible opportunity to just see God do an incredible work this evening. So I want to dive right into our scripture and then we're going to have some fun. We're going to talk. We're going to hang out. You'll get to hear from Jay one more time. I'm really, really excited. So I want you, if you've got a Bible, to go to the book of John with me. The book of John chapter 4. John chapter 4. I'll read the scripture and then I'll give you some context to this passage here in just a few minutes. John chapter 4, we're literally going to read like two passages, two little scriptures. Verse 13. Start at verse 13. And you might have heard this before. These are the words of Jesus speaking to the woman at the well. And listen to what he says. It says this, Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. He's talking about the water that's in the well. But... Whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling to eternal life. Come on, will you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I give you permission to speak tonight. We love you. In the name of Jesus, come on, somebody shout amen. Amen. I'm reading through this passage, right, and I get to the very end because I've read it so many times. I've preached it so many times. Something jumps out to me as I read through it again. When Jesus specifically tells this woman that the water I give them, the eternal living water, this particular passage or translation uses the term spring. It will become in them... A spring of water welling up to eternal life. I've been to a spring. When I grew up in youth group, we used to, over the summertime, go to a spring. Go to the springs in Florida. It's, it's a totally different world than floating down the Chattahoochee River, y'all. I'm just being real. I don't know about you, but I like to see the bottom of the water. If it's cloudy and murky, I don't know if I'm going to be getting in it. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if I want to jump in there. A spring is pure. A spring is clear. A spring is consistent. This particular passage, he says, becomes inside of you. You get a spring inside of you and it flows out of you into eternal life. And the reality is like having been to a spring, having done the whole float thing, come on, have y'all ever been and like floated down a river before? You tie your rafts together, you get on the thing and you float for hours and hours and hours. You forget your sunscreen and you're completely sunburned. By the end of the day, you're exhausted, you're worn out. We used to do all of those things. And what's fun and absolutely incredible, this one particular spring we used to go to, you could actually get into the pool of the spring itself coming out of the ground. So clear that you could literally drink the very water that you're in. So pure that you could see 30 feet down to the cave where it was coming out of the Florida aquifer, actually flowing up. 
And then you get to actually float down the river that the spring is producing. The spring produces life itself because as this river is formed, all of these things are growing with the river. All of these different creatures find home and shelter in the spring. Fish swim in the water. Animals live on the side of the water. Vegetation and trees are growing. It's constantly green. There's constantly life. Why? Because the spring never runs dry. It's constant in the way that it continuously flows. It jumped out to me when this translation used the term spring because it reminded me that that is what Jesus and the gift that he gives us, that's what happens on the inside. I want to title tonight's talk simply this, Running on Empty. Running on Empty. A year ago, none of us were prepared for all of the announcements that were made as church closed down. As schools lock their buildings, as businesses shut down, families are running around trying to figure out what to do with their kids. Owners of companies are trying to figure out how to pay the bills. People are trying to know if I'm safe to even go outside. And everybody who thought they had it all together realized real quick, I ain't got nothing together. And the conversation that often would take place before was when you would say to somebody, hey bro, hey, how are you doing? How's things going? My response, your response, I can guarantee was often, I'm good, I'm good. I'm just busy. I'm just busy, right? I just got a lot going on, fake smiles, fake smiles. I'm just busy, busy, busy. The conversation last year changed from saying I'm busy to, hey, how are you doing? What's going on? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I'm just tired. I'm just tired. I'm worn out. I'm running on empty. And we realize this as we are trying to figure out ways to fill us back up in a world that seems to be shutting down. And here we are as things are opened. Life is pretty much in most ways back to at least some form of normalcy. And many of you and many of us are still running on empty. You ever ran on empty before? You ever been so tired, you're just like, bro, don't even talk to me right now because I don't even want to listen. I got to go to bed, bro. You ever ran on empty before and you've tried to push through and you're just grumpy all the time? You get so hangry, you know what I mean? It's, it's just like everything annoys you. You can't even be productive because you're just trying to survive, right? You can't even give life because you're trying to survive your own life by itself. Running on empty. It's not a healthy place to be. I, I remember I used to get made fun of because my car, when I used to drive in college, um, I, I don't know if I had some supernatural like anointing on my life in my car, but my car always ran on E. Like I was as broke as a joke, right? So I did not have no gas money. And so I would get every last drop out of my vehicle as possible. I drove a minivan. It was baby blue. I called it a swagmobile. It was off the chain. All my friends wanted to ride with me because it was the party bus. Except we played Jesus music and we went to church. That was a party right there. <laughs> and everybody, anytime they would get in my car, they'd be like, bro, you need gas. And I'd be like, I, I know, but this thing's going to just keep on running. Eventually I learned my lesson, running on empty, at some point you will run out of gas. At some point you will continue and continue until you can't continue any longer. I remember running out of gas and you always do it at the most inconvenience of time, right? It's not like you're at a red light and you're next to a gas station and then it decides to run out of gas. You're in downtown Atlanta in the middle of gridlock traffic, everybody's honking around you and then... You run out of gas and you're like six lanes to try to get over. That was me. Running on empty in your car is one thing. Running on empty in your life is a whole different world. Because often it takes us hitting rock bottom to realize I need something to fill me back up. 
This woman at the well, to provide you with a little bit of context in the scripture that we just read, what had happened was, what had happened was Jesus had been walking, he had been traveling, and, and the reality of Bible back then was these people called the Jews and this other group called Samaritans did not get along. They were religious, political enemies. One was unclean, one was holier than thou, they just didn't get along, so they avoided each other altogether. So as Jesus is ministering with his disciples, the scripture said he, he usually would go around Samaria. But this particular time, Jesus says, I have to go through Samaria. I've got to go through Samaria. And all the disciples are like, say, what? You know there's some whack folks that live up in Samaria. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Why are we going through Samaria? And Jesus had a plan and a mission. I love this though. Y'all know Jesus was human, right? Like he breathed air. He was a real individual. He had emotion. And yet he lived the perfect life. This shows you the humanness of Jesus. Because what happens is, before this particular conversation takes place, it says that they went to a well. Jesus took his boys to Jacob's well, a well in Samaria, in a town called Sikar, and they crashed at the well. You know why? Jesus was thirsty. Jesus was so thirsty, he said, I need to go get some water. So him and all his disciples went to this well. Y'all want to know something funny? Jesus was so human, in fact, I think he got annoyed. Because before he had this next conversation, he tells all the disciples that are with him to leave. And go get food. He's like, fellas, listen, I need y'all to go to Cheesecake Factory. I'll catch up with you later. But you know why he sent them to Cheesecake Factory? Because he knows it's going to be at least a 45-minute wait just to get in. And another 45 minutes to eat their food. So he's like, I got a solid, you know, hour and a half to be by myself. Jesus was human enough to possibly, most likely get annoyed, to be thirsty, to need water. He was spiritual enough to know the conversation that was just about to take place. Because what happens next is one of the most incredible passages of Scripture in this particular Bible story. Because what happens next is as the disciples roll out, it says it was around noon and a woman was approaching the well. A woman approaching the well around noon is unheard of because it's hot around noon. To give you more geography and more context to this entirety of passage here, most women who went to draw water would draw water around the evening time in the cool of an evening because the heavy, heavy things of water that they would have had to carry would have been a struggle in the heat of the day. They also wouldn't have come alone. They would have come with a group because they don't want to be stranded by themselves in case something happens. But it says that this woman approached the well by herself around noon. That already should be a red flag, like something's not right. Jesus sent his disciples off so they wouldn't interfere with the conversation that's about to take place, and then they start chit-chatting. Jesus purposefully interacts with this woman and says, can you give me a drink? She replies, well, you don't have anything to draw water from, and that's when he throws this one line of a scripture out that blows her mind. He starts saying stuff like, this water is temporary, but the water I can give will last you forever. And she's like, what? What have you been drinking, bro? What you smoking, dog? Like, she is confused for the moment trying to figure out what in the world is he talking about. But in the back of her mind going, this could very well be the guy everyone is talking about. In all reality, this woman had been searching for answers for many, many years. Because later in the text, Jesus asks her a question. He says, go get your husband. She tries to pull a fast one on Jesus. <laughs> she replies after he says, go get your husband. She's like, I ain't got a husband. You wrong. And Jesus, being so gangster, he looks her up and he says, hey, I know you don't have a husband. In fact, you've had five husbands. And the man that you are sleeping with right now ain't even your husband. And she backed up and said, oh, snap. He knows more about me than I know about myself. This woman at the well had been searching. Her answers. She had been trying to fill her life with every other thing but the true source that can sustain her forever. Eternal life, eternal water that Jesus can provide you, the living water, is the greatest fill up of all 
time. I like to say it like this. What the world can give you might make you feel free. Can you all agree? What the world can give you might make you feel free. You can go search for it yourself. But the reality is the feeling will go away. Therefore, you have to continuously go back to that very thing. That's not freedom. That's addiction. That's not freedom. That's bondage. Although I feel free, when that feeling runs out, i got to go back to it to feel good again. The truth is the world makes you feel free, but Jesus Christ can set you free. Come on, can I hear an amen? Amen. I don't have to keep trying to do new things. When I experience the freedom that Jesus can provide me with, nothing else is as good. The end of the story is so cool because this woman who was running on empty thought, she was just walking to the well for a routine water break. And what she experienced changed her life forever. At the end of it all, the conversation that she has with Jesus finally opens her eyes to realize this is the man everyone's been talking about. This is the man, the Messiah who did all of these miracles, who has all of these prophecies, this is him. Instantaneously from experience Jesus, she's filled. It says she drops her water, the very purpose for her coming to the well to begin with. She drops it and she runs to the city. And the entire city gets saved because of her testimony. That's a powerful story, amen? That's an incredible passage, and it's, it's one of those churchy things that we read over, and we're like, oh, yeah, you know, I learned that back in the day. But the truth is, how many of you sitting here today are broken, are hurting, and are running on empty? Last night, you might have been like, why the heck did he break a pot? And what in the world was this woman over here doing? Like there's a light. I'm like trying to figure out what the heck is she gluing it back together. There's an incredible Japanese technique in pottery restoration. And the beauty of this particular technique is that whatever pot needs restoring, broken, shattered, completely put into different pieces... As it's not only glued back together, it's infused with gold. And as this pot, which was shattered and broken last night, is restored, it is now more valuable than before it was broken the first time. The value of this pot is even greater after its restoration because of what is put on the inside. Which in all reality means that as a simple bowl, it says it restore on it, by the way, which is kind of cool. In all reality, the restoration that needs to take place in your life not only will get you to where you used to be before you were broken, but it will actually set you free and put you on a new journey that's even greater than the one you were on before. A broken pot being put back together is one thing. A broken life being restored by the love of Jesus is life changing. And I just think after reading this text in this moment, I want to give you a a first-hand perspective on what this looks like in an individual. Jay's been hanging with us all weekend. Some of y'all got to high five her. See her, you got her snap. She got your snap. Y'all been changing. Jay, you can come up here and join me if you want to. Jay, not too long ago, though, had a totally different story. She'd been searching for answers, trying to fill her life. And then all this fame and fortune comes her way. And I'm going to let you get an inside story from Jay herself of just how powerful being filled with nothing but Jesus can do. Take it away, Jay. You good, you good. Is there a button on there? I got you. There it is. Hey, how are you doing? Are you good? Okay, so I'm not a preacher. I'm going to try to get real and deep, try to make it quick and fast. Um, you are totally feel, like, feel free to like, talk back because I might ask you a question. 
I think I want to start off by saying, obviously, you know, like, what I do, I'm on TikTok, whatever. Um, I want to ask you, you can be honest, if you had the chance to be TikTok famous, would you do it? Wow. Be honest. Because I've seen how y'all treated me when I walked in here, so yes or no? Okay, well, I'm going to be straightforward. If it was, if I was told by God to drop it tomorrow, would do it hands down. Wow. You guys that may or may or not like followed me for like a year, maybe recently, whatever, that was a fake, empty, very depressed, suicidal person. And that app was such an escape for me to where <laughs> you, oh, you got, you got seen it. I don't even have to tell. I don't even have to go through it. And you know, I relate to the girl at the well because I was so thirsty. And my breaking point was Corona. We all had a huge, like, bad year. I was basically, I mean, I wouldn't say, I think I had, like, a $500 roof over my head. <laughs> like, we went, my family and I went through the worst year ever of, like, basically being homeless. And I'm still behind the screen that many of you may or may not look up to me, which I really don't want you to. Um, I'm not Jesus. But anyways, I think I was so bound and dead to my sin to where any little thing, I mean, you know, your escape route, you can try to find, I know your girls in here might have a boyfriend, right? When you're upset, you want to get happy from him, right? <laughs> but when he, don't, he, when he doesn't make you happy, you're like, oh, my day's ruined, right? I've been there. I was suicidal. If you're like, you don't want to, if you're like, I know you guys are in school. You've ever been bullied? Like, bad? Anybody in here? Yeah. yeah? Well, um, sometimes that can affect your mindset, and that can make you, you know, a little bit depressed inside, and it sucks. Anyways, well, <sighs> it's hard of going back to the world because every single time you go back to the world, you will be let down time and time and time again. And just save yourself the struggle of just, like, stop running from God. Don't run from the Holy Spirit. You know what's right. You know what's wrong. You are going to be having shackles on your feet. And, of course, my experience was a little bit different where um, it was in front of millions of people on the Internet. <laughs> you know, how great. But I was so restored when, you know, going through that, like, I was hitting rock bottom. Like, all I had was God. I didn't even have a bedroom. I didn't have any real friends. They, don't, they didn't look at me as like Jaden. They looked at me as my username on a man-made app. I, I didn't have anything. I had my family, they were stressed out. And you know, one night I was kind of, I was gonna do something horrific. And I was like, you know what? Let me try one more time. Like one little piece of like wholeness. Like what, what, what should I do? I haven't, talk, I haven't talked to Jesus in years, but something told me, like, download the Bible app on your phone, right? I remember sitting in, like, the middle of nowhere, already scared, and I looked down, and I downloaded the app, read some verses, and I felt, a, like, a like calmness for once. I felt safe, and I'm literally in the middle of nowhere. Like, a bear could have ate me. And I felt so safe in my car, been through such traumatic experiences of my life changing, all that, like literally like a, you can't, I was trying to escape every way. I was trying to escape my life of like telling myself, nah, I'm not on the internet. Like it was just a lot of suppressed hidden feelings. And I came to the realization the next day that night of not doing something horrific, I was seeking Jesus again. I was really, really finding him and you know, he found me like probably that morning to where I told my parents, hey, I think I want to read, I want, I want to read, a, I want to read a Bible, like I want to get a Bible. Uh, that was the first time, I think in 20 years, I'm 20, um, my dad brought home my mom and I, like, like emotional, um, a Bible for my whole family. And um, I, I think he, uh, um, I think he used me as a light, maybe because he knew 
I would give him the glory that he deserves because I was such a, I still am. I did the things that put him on the cross. I did it, and I really don't want you guys, you're young, to not make the mistake like I have. Take it from someone to know the pain that you don't have to go through. You know, like, I think I would, I stopped going to church at like eight years old, you know. Stay what you're doing, stay on the narrow path. There is a reason why Jesus Christ says, the, the road is, is huge. Like I, I had, I was not blind anymore. You, I, I was in California. You already know who I, I would hang out with, you know. It's the world is dark. We are called to be the light. And you, you can be, don't give up. And you know, let him use you. It's like, I'm gonna do a little metaphor. Sorry, I just cried. I'm, uh, he's so good. Um, it's like, have a, have, you're having a huge like Santa Claus, a big bag like on your back, right? Well, I got rid of anxiety. I'm good, I'm gonna go meet Jesus. Oh, I got rid of depression. Oh, I'm good, let me talk to Jesus. You, you're not gonna fit through the door. You have to literally surrender your life. Deny yourself and follow him. Give it all to him. He, you didn't choose him. He chose you before you were even born. He chose you. You don't feel loved? Lie. You don't think you have purpose? Lie. You feel like you don't have purpose because you are going everywhere but the Father who created you. You might be going into the world. You're not going to find purpose, truth, and love because Jesus is the only one that can set you free from that. And I am living proof of what our Father in heaven can do and will always do. And if you're struggling, you don't have to like hide it. Talk to your community. This right here, you guys are my brothers and sisters in Christ. There ain't no libels. I don't want you to see me as, oh, she might be a celeb. Jesus is the only famous person in this world. Please don't idolize anybody, not myself. I am no different than you, okay? We all sin differently, but I'm telling you, give every sin to Jesus Christ. Every temptation you can be. All those negative thoughts you can you can get rid of, you know. Just step on his neck like Jesus did. <laughs> step on Satan's neck. <sighs> it's just so good how he can change your life, and you know you can be living proof. You can, you know. And you back to what you said earlier. Who you hang out with matters. If you hang out with five smokers, you're going to be the sixth one. If you hang out with five toxic people, you will be the sixth one. I was in every friend group you can imagine, okay? Every friend group. This is the only group I feel like home at. Because Jesus finds you. He, we're, you're connected to him. You, we're all made in the image of God. Oh, he's so good. That's good. good. <laughs> Take it away, man. That's good. Come on. Let's God put our hands good. together. Come on. Thank you, Jay. Ah. Press it, girl. Good job. That was awesome, okay? That was amazing. That's good. You got it. Right. Come on, jump up on your feet. Come on, get up on your feet. Let's celebrate one time. Come on, get up on your feet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on. Come on, can we give God some praise for this moment? Yeah.